Welcome to the Askeville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. We're so glad you've taken the time to listen, and we pray this message from our pastors will be a blessing on your life this week. I'm here, and I had this, I tried to walk, I had this cool walk, you know, like a chicken with a pulled hamstring, kind of, kind of whatever, but this girl walked up to me, and I began to talk to her or whatever. It turns out she was a believer, a Christian. I, I never really knew a believer. And she said to me one night in her backyard, she said, you know what, we can be friends. She said, I'm serving Jesus, but uh, we can be friends, but I want to invite you to come to church with me. And uh, I went to church with her because I wanted to get in good with her and her parents. That was the only reason. Went to church on a Sunday night. Never went. I went to church maybe once or twice as a kid uh, on Easter, but we went to a place, didn't talk about Jesus, the gospel, whatever. But I go to church with this girl because she was pretty, and I wanted to impress her parents. I sat in the balcony of a church in Massachusetts, and that night I got blasted by the power of Jesus Christ. I remember sitting in that room for the first time hearing about the cross and the love of Jesus. And, and this girl sitting right to my left. And I'm starting, I got tears coming, whatever. And I, I was embarrassed and everything. But that night, Jesus Christ changed my life. Why am I telling you that? I'm standing in a school in North Carolina right now. Because a 15-year-old girl had the guts to tell me she was a follower of Jesus. Whenever I travel to Africa or India or Romania, I, 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 those places, and people get sick, I, I go there because a 15-year-old girl, 15 years old, had courage to tell me that she was a, a follower of Jesus. Now listen careful. Because there's this mindset, you know, Greg, I'm uh, middle school, I'm high school, I, I'm trying whatever, uh, all the pressures, all the things, but God is still looking for young people that said, God, I want to serve you, and I want to do it now. Now, some of you are not going to do it, but some of you are. His name was Trevor, 11 years old, Trevor, watching the evening news up in, uh, up in the north part of the country. And mom and dad were preparing dinner that night, and Trevor was watching the news, and uh, there were some homeless people. It was cold winter, and, uh, and Trevor went to his father and said, Dad, can you uh, just please take me somewhere quickly after dinner? And uh, he said, son, where? He said, Dad, please just tell me. And said, yes, and I will. And so Trevor, they have dinner. He goes to his room and gets every blanket in his room. His father brings him to downtown Philadelphia. And his son says uh, to the father, Dad, can you stop here? He gets out of the car in a homeless area with all kind of poverty. And this guy watches his 11-year-old son walk up to a homeless guy that's got nothing freezing and gives him a blanket. Uh, the next week, he said, Dad, I can't shake this. I, I, I'm, bur- I'm burdened about people that have no place to home, and it's freezing. And I saw they got every blanket in their house, and they took them back in the center of Philadelphia. He gave all his blankets. Somehow, a local news station caught wind of this and interviewed Trevor, and it went viral. And what happened was people began bringing truckloads of blankets to Trevor's house. The kid's 11 years old. They filled the garage with blankets, and they were going out, giving them the homeless people. And then, and, and then they saw our garage is full. Uh, people donated storehouses, uh, a big, big building, bigger than this, that called it Trevor's Place. Name was Trevor. And, and for many years, it was unnecessary for any homeless person in Philadelphia to go to bed cold at night because, without a blanket because an 11-year-old kid said, you know what, I'm going to serve God and I'm going to do it now. I, yeah, I want you to think about this because I, I, I have to, I was thinking traveling in this morning, God, just help me with these young people. I'm getting older. God, I was kind of nervous. I am nervous, whatever. And um, God, just, I want to speak because the devil's after you. This whole idea, well, you know, we got to be careful. No, don't challenge young people too much. That's over. Uh, we now find young people, middle school, high school, are questioning their gender. I want you to know something, that when God made you, God didn't make a mistake. When God made you, he knew exactly who you were supposed to be. And so the devil's after you. I, I, I know it's uncomfortable. You walked in, you're, you're amazing, whatever, and, uh, and just a, a future sin. But, but Satan cannot stand you. Yeah, and that's for all the confusion, all the, the problems and the, uh, uh, the gender confusion and, and wanting to live like the world and, and all these different things. But the fact is God happens to care about you. 
Now listen careful. We just went through Christmas, and uh, I love Christmas, whatever. And uh, imagine, imagine years ago when God saw the world, all the sin, all the problems, and God said, "You know what? I gotta send my son. I gotta send my son into the world uh, to be born as a baby in a manger." And to do that, guess what God did? He looked all over the world for a teenager. That's amazing to me, Kayla. That's amazing to me. That God looked for a teenager and God found a little girl named Mary. I, I want to read it to you. It, it's in Luke chapter 1 and it, it says the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth in a village in Galilee to a virgin named Mary. Let me stop there. Imagine you wake up as a teenager one morning. You're walking in the kitchen to get some cereal or a bagel or oatmeal and the angel shows up in your house. Or you wake up and the foot of your bed's an angel. I'm talking an angel. And the angel Gabriel says, Mary, it's there in Luke chapter 1. You are favored among women. You are favored among women. And, uh, and uh, God shows in you. And, and he shares with Mary that, Mary, something's about to happen to you. Imagine you're a teenager. Some feel you may be as young as 14 years of age when this happened. And the angel says, it's in your Bible. He, he says, you're going to conceive. You're going to get pregnant, Mary. Uh, not in the natural way, but supernatural. Uh, God's going to overshadow you, and you're, you're going to conceive by the Spirit, and you're going to give birth to a son named Jesus, and he'll save the world from all their sins. Uh, uh, the Bible tells us how she reacted and this and that, whatever. And, and then at the end, she, she said, may it be as you have said. She said, yes. My question for a few moments is why did God choose Mary? Why did God choose Trevor? Uh, why did God choose Mary? Why did God choose that girl at 15 to have the guts to look at me and say, Greg, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I want you to come to church. There are young people, um, maybe, that, that were in the room, I hope not, that would say, Greg, I, I can never do that. Why did God choose them, and why did God choose Mary, and why is God wanting to choose some of you? The first reason I believe God chose Mary, because you knew that Mary was open to the immediate. Now, what does that mean? When the angel said to a teenage girl named Mary, you know what, Mary, uh, God's going to use you. You're going to pregnant, whatever, and uh, by the Spirit, you break to Jesus. Mary did not say, Gee, uh, Gabriel, you caught me at a bad time. Uh, Gabriel, I'm in middle school in North Carolina. Uh, can you come back in five years and maybe I can work with you? Uh, Mary did not say, you know what, you know what, Gabriel, I, I, I liked you, but I, I, I got a big uh, uh, event this weekend or I, I've got, I got school, whatever. Bible tells us Mary obeyed the Lord right then and there. God's looking for young people that say, I will serve you and I will do it now. We're meeting young people, listen, around the world, in Africa, in India, Romania, in, in America, they're serving Jesus now. My first mission trip ever uh, was about a million years ago to Egypt. I brought 17 young people. The youngest was 12 years old. We walked into the orphanage in, in, uh, in Egypt and uh, the Lillian Trash Orphanage and, uh, and, and where the, ba the infants were. And uh, I, 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 almost, I almost vomited. And the things I smelled, the, the flies in the eyes of the babies and the, and, and the disease. And I, honestly, I almost puked. And I remember others had to walk out. Uh, we had 17 kids with us plus workers, and after a few hours of uh, walking around and praying for little babies, uh, we walked out, and my wife says, where's Pammy Bennett? Pammy Bennett was 12 years old, and she's not in America, just watching another show, and uh, she was in Egypt across the ocean serving Jesus, and we're thinking, where's Pammy? And we go back in the nursery, and there's a 12-year-old girl, come on, 12 years old, who would have blamed her? She's back home in America just watching TV or, or, or doing whatever on social media. But she's weeping over babies and getting the filth of the flies out of their eyes. She was weeping over those kids. I almost didn't take Pam because she was so young. But it was like God reminded me at that moment, you're never too young to give God your all. I have to do this today, man. I know it's morning and I'm kind of intense and please forgive me. But listen, God wants you, but God wants you now. He wants you to serve him now. That doesn't mean you don't play high school basketball. That doesn't mean you don't have fun with your friends. But it means that you say, Jesus, I want you to know like Mary and Luke, I'm going to serve you and I'm going to do it right now. 
I'm asking God. I prayed coming in. I thought, God, please raise up somebody in this morning's chapel that to use to shake nations. Raise up a young guy or girl that won't just go the way of, uh, well, I'm in a small town, North Carolina, uh, this and that, I just whatever, I won't do this. And let a dream be birthed in you today. That says, God, I'm going to live for you, and I'm going to do it absolutely right now. Now, the reason I believe God chose Mary, not only because she was open for the immediate and said, God, I'll serve you now, but she was open to the supernatural. I imagine when the angel said to Mary, imagine when he said, you know what, Mary Lynn, uh, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, Caitlin, right? Uh, Caitlin, and uh, you're going to get pregnant and give birth to God's son, and uh, who would have who blamed Mary? If she said, you're freaking me out. What, what do you mean this being overshadowed by the Spirit and not giving birth? I mean, it could have freaked any one of us out. But God chose Mary because you knew that Mary was open to the supernatural. Now, please hear me on this. If you're a student in this school and say, you know what, God, I'm going to live for you and I'm going to begin to do it now. I'm, I'm no more compromised. I, I'm serving you. I'm doing it now. My friend, you're going to experience the supernatural like you've never thought you could ever experience. I remember a young teenage girl back in America, and her name is Trinidad. I love that name. God called her to go to Bible school. She goes to Bible school, didn't have any money. And, uh, and she began taking out school loans, uh, working hard, whatever. But she said, God, I'll go. Uh, our family doesn't have any money, but I'll, I'll go. I'll serve you, but I, I'll do it now. But I don't know how it's going to happen. You watch God step in and bless you if you give God your all. She began to work at school, jobs, and, and uh, but took out school loans. It was in her senior year. Had thousands of dollars in school loans. And she was working one day in the administration building vacuuming a floor, one of her jobs, to raise money to help pay for her school costs. And there was a wealthy businessman who drove by the college that day up in Pennsylvania and, and just felt God speak to him and said, go into the school, talk to the president. So he went in, a wealthy, wealthy business guy, and sat down and said, Mr. President, I, I know about your college and you're raising up your men and women of God. And so I, I, I just drove by and I thought God nudged me to come in. He says, I, I don't, I've never been here, but I drove by. And he said, God's blessing me. He says, I want to bless one of your students. I, I want to I, I want to bless one of your students. And right as he's saying that, Trinidad is vacuuming the rug outside the door of the president's office. The timing was perfect. Now she's vacuuming the rock, the president knew Trinidad, her commitment, her love for Christ, and, and what she was doing for God, and, and the price she was paying. And so he called Trinidad in the room. She leaves her vacuum, and goes in the office, and within 15 minutes, four years of school was all completely paid for. In one second. But why, why am I saying that to you? Because if you surrender to Jesus... You watch God supernaturally meet every single need you're ever, ever going to have. There's somebody breathing in this room today. I have to do this. The devil's working overtime to steal and kill and destroy young people. He's trying to wipe out his generation and with all the sin, all the compromise. And I, I've no offense to this, this is a great school, but I've not been to one Christian school in over 40 years that didn't need a fresh mold oh, with all the great things that there weren't young people that are walking a fence or walking the line. And but God's stirring them and God's speaking to them because God loves you and God cares about you. So why did God choose Mary? She was open to serve God now in the immediate. She, he chose Mary because he knew Mary was open to the supernatural. But another reason God chose Mary, are you listening? Somebody shout, yes, if you are right now, come on. He chose Mary because she had a heart of humility. When God said Mary, when Gabriel said, Mary, you were highly favored among women, she didn't get this attitude and sweat around the school campus and whatever, and flipping her hair and looking down on people. The Bible tells us she became deeply troubled and disturbed. God isn't looking for arrogant young people. He wants young people with a spirit of humility. I was a youth pastor about 500 years ago. 
back when I wore my pants a lot, lot, lot lower. Sweetheart, when you, when you, buddy, when you turn, when you get over 50, I'm over 60 now. But when you get older, you, you, you pull your pants higher and higher every year. It's unbelievable. Someday your pants will be up to your chest. I'm telling you what's right, going to happen to you, okay? It happens, whatever. And uh, you ever see young people, they wear their pants really low, their underwear sticking out, you ever see that? And they kind of walk like this. Ever see that, whatever? They got their butt hanging out, whatever. Well, uh, we, and we, all, all us adults look and go, man, that's sick. That's, I don't need to see your underwear, whatever. And they kind of walk, we're low. But when you get over 50 and 60, you hike them up as high as you can be and walk around the pool. Listen, it, it, it's, it's a, it, can, it can make a, a demon puke. It's so disgusting. God is looking for young people who have a spirit of humility. So I'm a youth pastor, and we had this, this Easter presentation. My wife did with a choir of young people. We, needed some, we had a great singing group, whatever, and, uh, but we need some people in drama. I want you to listen carefully to this. So we have young people come up, and uh, one boy named Michael Gavioli came up and said, Pastor Greg, I love to be a part of the drama. He was Lazarus. He, it was about evidences of the resurrection. We would have young people come out in front of our church, about 2,000 people, whatever, on a Sunday night, and uh, come out dressed like a, a in Bible costume, he, in like act out um Lazarus and talk about what Jesus did. So Michael said, I'll do it, whatever. Another girl came up and said, I'll do this, whatever. But one girl walked up to me, and the way she even walked up to me, she said, Pastor Greg, she says, you need me to be a part of this. And uh, I, we'll call her Mary, whatever, I forget what her name was. And I said, well, okay. And she says, I'm in every school drama at school. I get the lead role every single time in my school. I, 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 every drama, I get the lead role every single time. And so I'm thinking, this girl is like Miss Actress, whatever, amazing. Uh, I, and, then, and then I had a tough moment because a girl named Roberta walked up to me. Roberta a, was a great girl, but she was borderline special needs, and she struggled socially, very awkward, just different, didn't fit in with all the, uh, the popular kids, and, and often made fun of a good girl, loved Jesus. But she walked up, and she said, very humble, Pastor Greg, I, I feel like God whispered to me. And so I'm going to be a part of the drama. And I'm thinking, oh, dear, I'm, I'm like laying hands on myself saying, dear God, no. And uh, I, I said, Roberta, uh, we can use you. Oh, we'd love to have your part. You can be a part of the, like the back scene thing behind the stage and whatever. She said, Pastor Greg, I'll do whatever you say. But I feel like God whispered to me. I said, Roberta, I want you to be a part of the drama. And I said, oh, I just, I was saying yes, but saying screaming no in my spirit. I said, baby, Roberta's getting, we're thinking, oh, dear God, dear God, help us, whatever. Well, what's amazing is Mary, Miss Hollywood, a Miss lead actress in all the high school dramas, she only attended a few of the rehearsals, and she had more things to do. I'm not trying to be unkind. I uh, pray God, says she's, but, but she just, you know, flipping, I got this, whatever. Roberta never missed one prayer meeting or one rehearsal. And there were some rehearsals I wish she missed because it was so bad what she was doing. Messing up lines, we're thinking, oh dear God, let the rapture happen before this presentation. Please either take her home or take me home, but this isn't going well. The night came for the presentation. Michael Gavioli walks out, and he was Lazarus. He talked about dead for in four days and how much he stunk and uh, made jokes, and but how Jesus Christ yelled out his name and how Lazarus was raised up from the dead. Michael did a great job. Another girl walked out. I forget who she was, and she shared about what Christ did and this and that, whatever. And then Miss Hollywood walks out. And we're thinking, okay, what, and she, and she, it, it was a train wreck. It was a train wreck. I, I, I mean, the girl that said she knew, she, 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 she knew nothing. She was making up lines and different Bible characters. And it, were, it went from bad to worse. And she almost walked off in tears. We were in tears as well. But it was an absolute train wreck. And, and uh, she forgot the lines. And she forgot the whole idea. It, 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 it was bad. It was bad. I'm not trying to be unkind, but it was bad. And then it was Roberta's turn. And I'm thinking, dear God. If Miss Hollywood blew it under the pressure of the moment, dear God, please come back right now. Please don't let this happen. And Roberta walks out very slowly. Actually, in my perspective, too slow. She walked out very slow. She was the woman at the well. And for the first 30 seconds, all Roberta did into the microphone was this. <sighs> <sighs> That's only 15 seconds, and it started to get awkward in the room. 
30 seconds, nothing. And I'm thinking, dear God, maybe I put Roberta in a tough spot. God, forgive me, have mercy. And then Roberta opened her mouth. And the moment Roberta opened her mouth, it was as if the anointing of God fell into that room. She became the woman at the well. She spoke about the shame and the embarrassment and sleeping around with different men and being ridiculed by people down by the water pots and, and the embarrassment until that day that Jesus Christ came to draw water. Listen, you could hear sniffling and sobbing all over the church as Roberta, she like, it's as if she became the woman at the well. My wife and I are standing off and we're like our mouths are draped open. We're thinking, what is this? And, you could, and she's like weeping and she what Jesus Christ had done in her life in that night. What a move of God. Not because of anybody, but because of a, of, of a 14 or 13, whatever she was, year old girl that, that, that took it serious, open to serve God now, that was open to the supernatural, and, and, and a girl that understood humility. Say, Greg, I'm here this morning, and, and I'd love for God to use me. I would love for God to use me. Don't get cocky. Don't get arrogant, man. Say, God, I'm nothing. Don't, and don't walk with a false humility of, of beating yourself up. Look in the mirror and say, God, I'm your son, your daughter. I am valuable to you because you are. I, I am so humbled I get to be here this morning because you're amazing young people. And you remind yourself that God loves you and God sees you. But be careful that we don't get a wrong spirit, that we get cocky and arrogant because that, that can rob, that can rob what God wants to do in your life. Are you still with me? Someone shout, yes, come on. So why did God choose Mary? Uh, not just open the immediate and supernatural and humility, but once Gabriel got done talking to her, the, Mary looked at Gabriel and said, I am the Lord's servant. I, I am your servant. Uh, uh, whatever, you, whatever you said, yes. He said, Greg, I want God to use me. Be a servant now, man. Let God you be a servant now. Uh, find ways to let God use you. Be, be, be someone that where it isn't all about whatever you, but say, God, I want to give you my best. And I'm going to serve you right now, however you want to use me. I'm almost done. Pastor, Pastor uh, Webb said, try to go until 3 o'clock this afternoon, but I can't go that long. I'm going to end right here if that's okay. Let's go back to Egypt. I'm with Egypt, my first mission trip ever. We're 17 high school kids. We walked into one room. We walked into one room. There was an older woman. Her name is Latifa. She had just one big tooth in the front of her mouth. She had, she had only the whites of her eyes. She was completely blind. She was in a room infested with flies, with garments all over the room. She was sewing in the room. We walked in with our team, and, 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 and uh, as Pastor Webb comes in, as we're talking with her, and we're, you know, we're, she was in charge of the widow section uh, of, in this orphanage, and she said, I, 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 my, my job is to care for the widows. And she says, I, I have a video, but not with me, but I, 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 I sew garments together so the young people can be warm during the cooler months in Egypt. And, and so, my, so my job is I sit in this room, and I just sew. She's blind. The woman can't and see I sew pieces of cloth together so of their sweaters and blankets and, and so she went on and then I opened up my big mouth I'm a youth pastor, and I thought I want to teach my young people. I want to encourage them. So I said this to Latifa. I said, Latifa, I said, man, the rewards God has for you. And I wanted to hear this this morning. I said, Latifa, the, the, the rewards and that God's got for you, man, what you're doing, and, and God's going to reward you, and, and all the encourager. And, and I said, all these hours, you spend alone in this room, and you're sewing garments and all. And when I got done, guess what she did? She rebuked me. What does that mean? She corrected me. She called me young brother. She said, young brother, you have it all wrong. She's saying it in front of many of my youth, young people. My, she says, you have it all wrong. She said, you tell me, I sit alone all day sewing. In the, she says, I haven't spent one minute alone in this room. She said, I've heard the voice of Jesus a thousand times over, as clear as I've heard your voice today in this room. I'm never alone, she said. He's with me. He sees me. He watches over me. 
And she said, you say rewards? She said, I don't know about that. But she said, my reward is to wake up every morning and as a reward of serving Jesus and blessing his children, his sons and daughters. She said, my reward is doing the will of God in my life. I believe that some 2,000 years ago, that God, as Pastor Webb plays, that God chose Mary because he knew that's a teenager who gets it. That's a teenager who gets it. That's a young person. I can count on Mary was used. Please hear this. So be, Mary was used to physically carry Jesus into this world. Where are the young people in this room who will spiritually carry Jesus into this world? It will be forever recorded in heaven's history books that this morning in North Carolina, on a Tuesday morning, God said, I need another student. I need another young person. You know, I believe that some students don't serve God 100%, not because they don't want to, not because they don't even love God. I believe it's, it's, it's a trust thing. And God wants you to know today that God sees you and God knows you and God loves you. You know, I'm very, I'm very sentimental. I'm, I'm really a sentimental guy, whatever. And not that, Kayla, I don't mean to embarrass you, but you walked in today. There's something about you, girl. I'm not trying to embarrass you, but I, really, I see God's hand on you. My wife and I have three babies in heaven. I just, I just wonder what it would be like, man, to have a son and see him raised up for a daughter. See them live for God. What would that be like? Some say, Greg, I want to live for God. I, I, re I really want to, but I, I, God, I, don't, I don't know if I can do it. It's all going to come down who you're going to trust. Some will trust their friends more than God. Some will trust this world. Some will trust whatever. But Jesus Christ wants you to know something. On your worst day, he loves you. I want you to hear this. On your worst day, dude, he loves you. On your worst day, honey, he loves you. Jesus, Jesus Christ loves you. Now, I want to end with this. There's a 10-year-old boy. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. Pray. We're done with this. A 10-year-old boy was with his family with a terrible car accident. And uh, thank God nobody was killed. But a 10-year-old boy lost his right arm in the accident. It was horrible horrible I can't imagine being 10 years old only having one arm I grew up in a gym like this matter of fact I'm glad we're, we're preaching that the gym is like this because if I was in the middle of the basket I'd be afraid of getting cold for three seconds in the paint I mean I just it's, it's my instincts whatever but but I can't imagine being playing basketball and football and baseball and I was a tennis teacher for many but I, I love I can't imagine being 10 years old and only having one arm he only had one arm it changed his life. After the physical therapy and all the things the father shared, his son went into a deep depression. I want you to listen carefully, and I promise him, he went into a deep depression. The father and his mom were so distraught, our boys in depression, and what are we gonna, he didn't want to be active in school, but get him withdraw from people. The father was driving home from work one day, and he saw in like, a, like, a, like a mall of stores, a, a karate or a judo store, or whatever, judo lessons or karate, and he pulled in and thought, maybe, and talked to the, the, the judo teacher, or what do they call him, the master of the things, I don't know what it is, and he would then said, my, my, my boy only has one arm, and, and um, you know, he's withdrawing, and he's just not involved in anything he said bring him in bring him in I want to give him I want to give him judo lessons I want to give him lessons 
when the father first told his son, his son said, Dad, I can't, I don't want to go with one arm. I don't want all the other kids in. No, son, please fry it. And, and the father brought his son the first day. The son went in, whatever, and got his little little white outfit thing they wear, whatever, and the other stuff they learned, whatever, and, and uh, had his first lesson. And the boy came out with, a, with an energy he hadn't had in several months. He, he loved it. He loved it. The kid received him. The, 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 the master, whoever the le- master they call whatever, uh, was, 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 was gracious in doing all these different things. And he wanted his second lesson, the third lesson, the fourth lesson. And the kid loved it more and more and more. But then one day he came out after the ninth or tenth lesson and said, Dad, I don't want to go back anymore. I'm not going. So what do you mean you're not going back? He said, Dad, all the other kids are learning all these different moves. He said, my master only teaches me one move. He only teaches me one move. The other kids are learning different different techniques and moves when they fight or whatever it could be. He says, he only teaches me one move. The father went and talked to the master, karate teacher, judo guy, whatever. He said, I know it might seem different, but he said, please trust your son with me. Trust me on this. Son kept going back, kids learning other moves, judo, karate, but he kept teaching that one arm boy one move over and over and over and over again. After months, the, the master teacher shocked the father and son and said, I've got good news for you. I've entered your boy into a judo contest next month. The father says, a judo contest? My boy's got one arm. He said, trust me on this. Trust me on this. Trust me on this. I'll prepare your boy. In the lessons leading up to the match, the tournament for judo, he kept teaching the boy, same move, same move, same move, same move, same move, one move. The tournament came. All the other kids were there. It was, of course, in, in age categories. And some of the kids were bigger than him. Some were, of course, way more advanced. But a miracle, he won his first match. The kid with one arm won his first match. And he did it with one arm. How did he win it? He used the only move that he knew. And he won. He was excited in the confidence and looking at all the other the kids. Well, maybe luck. And he won the second match. He won the third match, won his fourth match. How did he win? He's got one. He simply used his only move. He got into the semifinals against a kid far more skilled than him. But what seemed miraculously and strange, now the crowd began to gather. They're all watching the one-armed karate kid in the semifinals. He beat a kid in his first ever tournament. How did he win the semifinals? He did it with one move. In the championship bout, he was up against a kid much bigger, much skilled, whatever, and it was back and forth. The other kid won a point, he won a point, back and forth, back and forth. It didn't look good for a while, but unbelievable to everybody in the crowd, especially that boy and that father. That one armed boy won the championship in his first ever karate or judo, whatever it was, tournament. He won first place. How'd he do it? He used one move. He had one move. Got the trophy, the pictures, excited, threw in the car, drive it home. Uh, his dad's in the front seat, the boy's in the back seat, the, the master karate guy's driving. They were very silent, no one's saying anything. And finally the boy said, he says, I got to know what happened today. He said, did you tell them to let me win? Did you tell them to let the one-armed boy win? How could I have ever won this whole thing? I've only got one arm. I've only, my first tournament. How in the world can I I win this? How can I do it? And the the master in the front seat laughed and said, I couldn't wait until you asked me that, he said. He said, you won because of two reasons. Number one, because you trusted your master. You trusted me. You trusted me when it didn't feel good. You didn't understand. You trusted your karate master. That's one reason you won. But there's another reason that you won. He said that one move I've been teaching you over and over and over and over and over again. 
He said, that move that frustrated you, that move that almost had you quit, that move that had you angry at me, watching. He said, the reason I kept teaching you that same move, same move, same move, same, he said, because of this. The only counter move, listen to this, the only counter move to the move I taught you is for your opponent to grab your right arm because you trusted me. They reached for what was not there because you trusted me. Because you trusted me. You are the champion of this karate tournament. There's somebody breathing in the room right now and God's saying to you, I just want you to trust me. Just give me your life. Do it now. Greg, if I don't do it now, does it mean I can't? No, I'm not saying that. God's full of mercy. But I'm saying this. There's somebody breathing in this room. I sense it in my spirit. You're here today. And God says, I want you now. Practice the one move. I will trust you, Jesus. Thank you for joining the Askeville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. For more information on our ministry, please visit our website at askevilleassembly.com.